and I'm Layla. Welcome back to our channel, Elementary My Dear. Where we make nutrition science easy for you to digest. Today we're super excited because we're kicking off our series on utero health. So if you have a uterus, this is for you. And if you know someone with a uterus, this is also for you. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss one of our videos. I think we can't talk about utero health without talking about our precious ant flow. When the Red River comes to town, I don't know. <laughs> when the Red River flows, our um, monthly gift. From Mother Nature. Is there anything you can do to kind of optimize your health as we go through this? Yeah, we're talking about menstruation. Anyone who's gone through menstruation, I'm pretty sure is pretty familiar with it, but we'll do a brief overview of what it is um, for people who are less familiar. And so menstruation is when the uterus lining builds up with, um, you know, there's blood and there's other tissues that are in there and it does that all month long. And then menstruation is the time where it gets rid of everything and it all comes out in a lovely flow. flow. So menstruation, as I said, is a part of our menstrual cycle, which is, you know, an average of about 28 days long. And it's kind of characterized by, you know, the rise and drop of various hormones. And menstruation specifically is kind of triggered by a drop in progesterone levels, which kind of indicates that you're not pregnant. Always good to know. <laughs> Typically we see the onset of menarche or the first period, because I think period is kind of the term that most people are familiar with, um, is between 12 and 15 years old, but as young as eight is normal as well. I was 11. I was 13, right on my 13th birthday. So oh, shout wow. out to Mother Nature for that. For me, it was 11 and a lot of my friends got it when they were like nine and 10. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time feeling like, like what's wrong with me? Like why haven't I oh, gotten mine yet? Really, for me, I was like, let this last as long as possible. <laughs> Obviously it's not a fun experience at all, but there was a little bit of FOMO for me. You know, as unpleasant as it is, and there's a taboo around it, it is seen in our society as a marker of adulthood and like coming into I guess, womanhood. There are cultures around the world where, you know, when someone gets their first period, it's actually a really big deal and it's celebrated and like celebrated to the point where you kind of have like a social event and many people come and give gifts and it's seen as like a very positive transition in someone's life. I think that's, it's beautiful. That's very right? beautiful. I know when, like, when I got mine, I was like, I don't want anyone to know. I was even like scared to tell my mom. Like, oh. So I think it would be nice if we lived in a society where we could talk openly about it. And it's a thing that about 50% of the population goes through. I would love a period party. Another reason to celebrate. So as we described, menstruation obviously involves, you know, the loss of blood. So it might be intuitive that, you know, when you menstruate, your iron needs are higher. People who menstruate have um, higher iron needs and that is 18 milligrams per day compared to 8 milligrams per day for people who don't menstruate. So it's actually quite quite a bit higher and I know that um, you know people who menstruate are a group that we look at uh, as a being at higher risk of iron deficiency. One form of iron deficiency is anemia and that's characterized by things like tiredness, weakness, fatigue, pale skin, headaches, dizziness. So if you think that you might be anemic, you're experiencing any of those symptoms, or you're afraid of your iron levels, maybe you think you're not getting enough, maybe you think you have extreme losses, go see your doctor um, to get your iron levels tested and talk about ways that you can, um, you know, restore those iron levels if they are something that you should that you are concerned about iron is something that you can get through food mm -hmm. so things like red meat chicken poultry fish those are great sources of iron additionally if you don't eat meat in your diet there's iron in um, legumes and uh, dark green leafy vegetables um, but this form of iron can be a little bit more difficult to absorb so um, getting more of those in there and also eating it with a source of vitamin C can be really helpful. We have a whole video about iron and vegetarian diets that you might want to check out. It gives lots of good tips on places to get iron that are um, not animal based and um, ways to improve your iron absorption. Do you ever get cravings around your period? See, I think this is hard because I don't know if it's like I expect it so it happens because honestly I have cravings like 365. I have cravings all, all the time for sweet foods. I have a huge sweet tooth. So sometimes I think it might be like a confirmation bias where I'm like, 
oh, I have a craving for this and I'm almost on my period. I'm the exact same way. I have a sweet tooth like every day basically, but I think like when, it, when it's right before your period, you kind of convince yourself that that's why it's happening. Exactly. And therefore it's justified. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I kind of have to wonder like, do are these cravings because your body has an increased need around the time of your period so there are studies that look at people as they go through their menstrual cycle and monitor their basal metabolic rate as they go through their menstrual cycle and basal metabolic rate you know that's the amount of energy you burn while at rest if you want to know more about that check out our video on calories what they found was the um basal metabolic rate fluctuates throughout the cycle and it's at its highest right before your period and at its lowest um right at the end of your period which is actually quite interesting because you know you kind of think you're getting cramps during your period and you kind of feel a little icky so maybe your body would be using more energy but it's actually quite the opposite yeah i think it shows that you know the, the entire month or the other part of your menstrual cycle where your uterine lining is kind of getting thicker and thicker that actually takes energy for your body to do that if that lining is quite nutrient dense it's there to support the embryo if you potential, potential life potential life so it has to take like it uses a lot of energy and a lot of nutrients to build that up and then it all goes to waste most of the time most of the time <laughs> it's worth noting though that the, the even though we do see fluctuations throughout the menstrual cycle the, the the changes aren't that dramatic so i mean i wouldn't say that you necessarily need to kind of intentionally change the way you're eating i think that Uteruses are very interesting. I agree. Very amazing. Love I the way that they work. Shall we move on to everyone's favorite topic? PMS. Premenstrual syndrome. And I'm sure anyone who's experienced premenstrual syndrome is familiar with the uh, many, many symptoms. <laughs> yes. You know, moodiness, uh, irritability, headaches, dizziness, maybe poor concentration. There's also physical symptoms like body aches, um, specifically breast pain, um, you know, like those pre little cramps that you can get before you even start your actual process of menstruation, among many others. It's a very interesting syndrome because it kind of touches on so many different things. To be honest, I feel very lucky when it comes to PMS. I don't experience a lot of those symptoms. I, and I have friends that go through quite mm -hmm. a lot every month. I feel very lucky as well in that respect. I will say though, I don't know, I've talked about this with a couple other friends as well, is like the, the pandemic PMS hits like a truck. I don't know what it is. I can imagine that stress would, like general stress would worsen any of those symptoms. Exactly. The prevalence of PMS in the population is about, about 50%, just under 50%, and that's worldwide. But what's really interesting is in some areas of the world, we see it at, prevalences up to 98%, which is basically like everyone. And other places, it's really low, like 12%. We were kind of chatting about this earlier, like kind of trying to try to understand or speculate why that might be, you know, whether is it actual physiological differences or is it more, you know, cultural, societal, you know, how much things are talked about or how much people are aware that this term even exists or even cultural understandings as to what PMS is. So you might be wondering, you know, is there anything you can actually do, you know, if you happen to be someone that does experience a lot more of the symptoms? And turns out there kind of is, there are things you can do. <laughs> Which is good to know. I'm sure anyone who experiences PMS is probably happy to hear that there are things to do. Although when you hear what it is that you could do, you might be less excited about it. Uh, the first main one is actually exercise. Studies consistently find that really the, the, the meta-analysis that I read said any form of exercise, although the types of exercise that are studied for women are very gendered, I find that we were just talking about this. It was like yoga, Pilates, aerobics. Um, so there's actually not that much research on like strength-based exercise, but you know, looking at the mechanisms by by which it works. I'm sure strength-based exercise helps as well. The research shows that, you know, people that maybe do exercise more consistently and regularly, there seems to be less PMS symptoms involved. And some of the proposed mechanisms were things like, you know, just the, you know, the reduction of cortisol and the release of endorphins and kind of the increase in blood circulation. It helps both, you know, psychological symptoms as well as physical symptoms. So things like the mood swings or the irritability, but also things like cramps. And just another reason to exercise. I just want to highlight though, it's not like, oh, I'm feeling a little PMS. Let me get one workout and I'll feel better. You might feel a little better because you do get the endorphins going exactly. after one workout. But most of the research and like the experiments that have been done in this area, it's been a little bit more of a prolonged program 
program. So um, typically in excess of 10 weeks, having multiple workouts um, per week, so about three or more workouts per week for at least 30 minutes. So this is, this is not something you can just do once or twice when you're feeling a little, un, un, I guess not under the weather, but a little PMSy. This is something you have to keep up consistently. So like all good things, it takes it takes time and effort. So let's move on to nutrition now. Mm -hmm. And kind of, again, I would say that, you know, there's no like magic pill necessarily, but the evidence does seem to indicate that just kind of having an overall healthy diet may help uh, manage PMS symptoms. So things like lots of vegetables, maybe five servings of vegetables a day, at least two servings of fruits per day, um, things like fish a few times a week, as well as a variety of whole grain foods. So something that is actually shown to help is taking a daily omega-3 supplement. So in doses of about one gram to two grams has been found to reduce PMS. And some of the thinking behind the reason that this works is a reduction in um, uh, inflammation in the body with uh, omega-3. So if PMS is something that you, um, you know, deal with a lot and it's impacting your life, maybe that's something to look into is an omega-3 supplement. There's also some evidence that taking a vitamin D supplement, about a thousand I use per day, could help with PMS symptoms as well. But you know, the research on that is a little, you know, it's a little unclear. We're not sure about the mechanisms. Um, but I think a lot of people benefit from taking vitamin D supplements regularly anyway. So that's certainly an option. That's the 411 on lifestyle, nutrition, and menstruation. Um, menstruation is something that affects 50% of the population at some point in their lives and it's important to know about the nutrition and lifestyle factors that can help or relieve some of the more negative effects of menstruation. Yeah, everyone experiences menstruation differently. I know some people have experienced much harder symptoms while other people might be able to kind of go through it a little easier. But you know, nonetheless, everyone that menstruates, we are losing quite a bit of um, blood and iron on a regular basis. So prioritizing iron is important. And you know, just eating a variety of very nutrient dense foods is something that seems to help manage any negative symptoms like that are involved with PMS. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you never miss one of our videos and follow us on our Instagram and our TikTok. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye.